ones and twos uh, for tonight's um, Kahima Educational Trust webinar with our special guest, Steve Snelling. Steve's been with us before, and it's great to have um, him back with us. He's a fabulous historian, and he's spent a lot of his life uh, publishing and writing about the stories that uh, will be, some of the stories we'll be talking about tonight. But um, we're looking forward to having maybe 150 or more people joining us from all around the world. And uh, it's really good. I can see the numbers clicking through, which is fabulous. Um, and uh, wherever in the world you're coming from, you're very welcome. It's going to be a fascinating subject tonight. And um, we're all very much looking forward to it. So uh, if you uh, want to say hello, uh, type your um, name and comments into chat. If you've got questions during the session tonight, then simply write them in the Q&A. We're, we're going to try and um, we're going to try and work very hard to ensure that we have time at the end to pick up some questions and uh, and I'll field them to to Steve, Steve at the end. That's really good. Well, um, some uh, old friends and some new ones joining, which is fabulous. I'm now going to hand over to Sylvia May, the chief uh, executive officer of the Kahima Educational Trust. Sylvia. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Kahima Educational Trust webinar. We've got a record number of first time attendees this evening, which is lovely. And welcome to you all, as well as to all our faithful regulars. Tonight, it is our great pleasure to welcome back historian and author Steve Snelling, who has prepared a fascinating talk on the subject of George Nolan and the commandos at Kangor. Steve has had a long held fascination with his subject. As a child, he was captivated by cartoons, more of which later, and these were closely followed by museum trips as a child, which brought home the reality of those drawings. And then later in life as a journalist, Steve was able to meet and talk to veterans who had known George. The story is a tragic one. Outgunned and outnumbered by odds of more than 15 to one, a small force of commandos fought one of the mo most desperate battles of the Burma campaign under the inspirational leadership of this 22 year old officer who was commanding a platoon in action for the first time. As always, we are honoured to have Dr. Robert Lyman here, author of many books on the Burma campaign, and he and Steve will take us through the story of this combined operation and its climactic close quarter struggle that helped decide the outcome of the third Arakan offensive. I'm sure that many of you will have questions. Please feel free to use the chat and QA buttons, as Rob's already said, they're at the bottom of your screen. I know that Rob and Steve will endeavour to answer as many as questions as there are time for tonight, and we will happily follow up afterwards by email if necessary. So without wanting to take up any more time, I will now hand over to you, Rob. We are um, spreading our wings a little bit tonight because um, our focus over the last couple of years, of course, quite rightly, has been the the Battle of Kahima itself, and we have extended that to look at um, the operations of V-Force and, uh, and, and, and the Nagas and the Hills and so on. And in due course of time in the next year or so, we will be looking in more detail at units and um, brigades and, and the divisions associated with the battle in Kahima. But we thought also that what we need to be doing is placing Kahima much more securely uh, in the context of the Burma campaign. Of course, we all know that the, the Battle of Kahima was in the early part of 1944 and, uh, and was midpoint, perhaps, of the, the Burma campaign itself, which started in early 1942. So the Arakan, or Arakan, the literal, the, the Burmese literal, played a very significant role in operations throughout the campaign from 1942 to 1945. And if the Burma campaign as a whole is forgotten, then the operations in Arakan have also been forgotten in large part because uh, they didn't go particularly well in, uh, in Arakan one or two. Um, in Arakan uh, three, of course, we had a slightly uh, uh, different set of events framing uh, the activities that we're going to be talking about tonight. And one of the most uh, significant was the battle for Kangor. Um, it's well known because of uh, some of the, the men who fought it, uh, uh, not least of all George Nolan, VC, 
which Steve is going to introduce us, who Steve is going to introduce us tonight. So it's a, a part of the campaign that is little aired, and we're delighted to be able to at least um, uh, improve that situation tonight by, by introducing you to it. Uh, and as, the, as time goes by, we'll be coming back to Arakan uh, more and more. And it's been interesting over the last week to hear that James Holland is thinking about writing a book on, on Arakan 3, so Arakan 1945 as well. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Steve. Thank you very much, Steve Snelling. All right, well, thank, thanks, Rob. And uh, thank you again to um, KET for, for inviting me to give this talk. As um, Sylvia said, that, that this has been a story which I've lived with throughout a long part of my life. It began really as a child uh, reading comics, um, followed on then through school trips to the Royal Norfolk Regimental Museum, where there was this, the painting, uh, which you can see at the moment, uh, on your screens of George Nolan's action at, at Hill 170. Uh, and then it followed on then as a journalist, I was in the fortunate position in the 1980s of being asked to write a series of articles um, for, for the newspaper that I worked with um, about George Noland, because at that time the regiment were trying to track down his Victoria Cross, which had been uh, gone missing or had been stolen in the 1950s and has never been found. Um, nothing came of that, unfortunately, but it did give me an opportunity to um, interview and speak with and correspond with a number of the commandos who were there with George Noland um, during those days. Um, and uh, the, tonight's talk is largely based around a lot of the interviews that I conducted at that time. Um, so if we can move on the uh, next slide, um, you'll see something of the, uh, of the comic that I first saw. I don't know whether Rob can move the next slide on. Yep. Um, and here you, you get an idea of the, the, the story that uh, I was first introduced to. This is my introduction to George Noland in 1961. Um, and uh, you can see the back cover as well if we move on to the next slide. I think the, the, next, uh, the next part should show you the, the back of the, 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 the comic. So you're not seeing that? No, not at the moment. It's, I think we're still on the front. <laughs> oh dear, it's... Um... Yeah, it's obviously got jam. Oh, there it is. It's there. Yep. Yeah. And then if we move on to the next one, which is the newspapers, the, the various articles that I uh, was asked to do, um, that will give an idea of those. And we'll, we'll go on to the introduction, really, which is that Bill, Bill Slim actually identified Kangor as the crisis battle of the third Arakan campaign. In, in, my, in my opinion, it was a, it was a soldier's battle on a par with Inkerman, and some have even likened it to Rourke's Drift. Um, it was a struggle in which small parties of men under junior leaders fought for their lives at, at, at extreme close quarters. It was a life or death struggle of savage intensity that one officer likened to medieval warfare. It was a kind of culmination of, a, of a, an operation which had been long thought about so far as the Arakan was concerned, that is to say, a combined operation uh, using amphibious, um, uh, as, a, as an amphibious operation. Um, the problem was that they didn't have the materials or the craft to do it for a long while, um, and training had been carried out with uh, the second British division to carry out this role um, as early as 1942-43. But of course, the second division found themselves at Kohima and it was left to what Slim called a scrap, the scrap iron landing craft rejects from the European theater of war to be employed in this particular operation. The plan, uh, according to Slim's account anyway, was that the, the idea was to remove the last remaining threat posed by the Japanese in the Western coastal area, um, pushing the Japanese far, as far back as to enable containment by a single division thus threeing up 
freeing up three more divisions for employment elsewhere. 15 Corps under Lieutenant General Sir Philip Christensen was to take the offensive. And with, for, for that purpose, he had, four, he had four divisions, 25th and 26th Indian, plus 81st and 82nd Africans. To, uh, and, and, and with them, the 50th Indian Tank Brigade and 3rd Commando Brigade. The, from, f they launched the offensive in, uh, in de early December. The immediate ad objective was to capture Akiab, but with the Japanese in full retreat, Akiab was abandoned without a fight. It then became a question of trying to cut off the Japanese and to complete a complete victory um, by advancing along the, the main coast road using the African divisions for that purpose. And then with the idea of land, making landings beyond them and cutting them off, cutting off their line of retreat. The idea was that they could then be destroyed between the hammer of the 81st and 82nd West African divisions and the anvil of the 3rd Commando Brigade and 25th Indian Division. Christensen himself had looked into the possibilities of where this action might take place. And he said that the best place, indeed the only possible one, was at a place called Kangor, where an approach by Chong, which is a, a, river, a tidal riverway, could be made under the cover of mangrove swamps and where there were a couple of breaks which could provide landing places. The Japanese had fortified the Kangor area, but Christensen had flown over it and had seen that the defences didn't look particularly strong. His idea was to use number three commando brigade to clear the Maibon Peninsula first as a preliminary to landings at Kangor and providing the block. Number one commando as the brigade's most experienced unit was tasked with spearheading this amphibious landing deep behind the enemy lines. The plan was for commando, third commando brigade supported by 51st Indian Brigade and a squadron of Sherman tanks belonging to 19th King George V own lancers to block the enemy's only motorable escape route along the Mayabong Tamando Road. All went according to plan after in, in the uh, after in the aftermath of my of my bond. I wonder, Rob, if we could move on a few of the slides. I think it seems like the slides have um, jammed, so I'll move on and uh, give this. Can you, yeah. Can you see them now? No. Oh dear, this is dreadful. Yeah. What slide can you see? I'm still on the back cover of the comic. Oh. It's not working at all, is it? It's no. working fine for us all. Is um, it? Yeah. Uh, our, all our audience can see it, and we, Rob and I can see it. I've now moved on to um, slide 15. Oh, right. OK, well, um, yeah, well, I'll tell you which slides to come back to, if that's OK. OK, OK. Um, if we could come back to slide six. OK. Sorry, everyone, we're just going to do a little bit of retracing our steps here. I've already shown the maps, Steve, but we'll go back to them. Okay, yeah. And, and I basically, I think that the slides um, six to 12 give, a, give an impression of the, um, the landings at Maibon, which was very, uh, they were very fortunate in so far as that, the, um, that the, it was an unopposed landing because the, they'd made a, an error in terms of the timing, which meant that they were having to land into deep mud and wade ashore. And had, had it been an opposed landing, it was widely agreed that they would have been slaughtered. Um, as it was, they managed to get ashore and uh, clear the peninsula in relatively short time. Um, 
having cleared the peninsula, they then moved on to the landings. And I think that uh, by if we get to uh, the, go through to between slide six to 12, yeah. shows the approach to along the Dang, Dangbong Chong um, towards the actual landing site, which was at just short of, of Kangor. And in order to do this, the uh, number one commando was transferred from a, uh, a sloop to 16 landing craft assault. Um, and they proceeded up the Dang Dangbong Chong on January the 22nd, 1945. Um, two hours after they began their approach, which was fortunately without any opposition, <coughs> A squadron of Mitchells, Mitchell bombers, launched an airstrike on point 170. Um, this was a preliminary to the advance um, by the command or the landings of the commando brigade. One of the one of the uh, artillery uh, officers who was in support of the operation, a chap called Stuart Guild, he called it the smallest beachhead of the war. He, he said that they approached via the enemy's back door. Um, they had two to five armed lookouts on each side of the of the launchers that were going up the up the Chong. They followed the red coloured boys that had been left by a combined operations pilotage party, to which marked the channel. And they on each side they were they were advancing through practically impenetrable mangrove swamps. The Mitchell bombers left a, a pall of dust hanging over the, the landing area. It was what uh, Stuart Guild called a pattern bombing American style. Um, they eventually reached their, birth, their intended berth and Guild with two men paddled ashore into what he called pure unadulterated mangrove swamp. Thick mud, slippery mud, covered roots and practically nowhere to, to stand new orders back aboard and headed further upstream to the beachhead where a gap in the trees allowed two landing craft assaults to, to, to land side by side. Together with four gunners, Gill set off ashore again. They walked through the swamp to the edge of a paddy field and peered over the bund at the rising ground, a forest about 200 yards away. There was no sign of any enemy. If we can move on to um, slide 13, Rob. Done. Yep. This chap it should be a, a chap who's bare chested fellow. And yeah. Um, yeah, and this is Aubrey Buxton, who was uh, a, 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 an artillery officer, uh, a naturalist who would uh, write and prepare a book alongside um, Sir Philip Christison on the birds of the Arakan. <laughs> Um, and he was a future creator of the survival TV series for Anglia Television. He described the setting at Kangor. He said the creator could have had no fixed plan when he made our bridgehead, a miserable place without one feature to commend it. From the water you flounder through a stinking belt of mangrove. From there you must squelch your way without any chance of concealment across a brackish swamp a mile wide before you reach Hill 170. If we then move on through slides 14 to 18. Despite the scantiest of intelligence and a potentially hazardous five mile approach in landing craft along the 100 yards wide Dangbong Chong, the first stage of the operation was accomplished with speed and little loss. Within a day of going ashore, number one commando had splashed through the inundated paddy fields seized the nearest prominence overlooking the beachhead, Hill 170, and beaten off a series of night counterattacks, some of them at, at extreme close quarters. In the days that followed, while other units extended the bridgehead into Kangor and its neighboring hills, Lieutenant Colonel Ken Trevor's number one commando consolidated the brigade's main position on Hill 170, which they came to share with the Marines of 42 Commando headquarters staff and gunnery observation teams together with a small newly landed armored force. The scrub and tree covered eminence, codenamed Brighton, was the area's key feature. 
whoever held it controlled the waterborne supply line and, and with it the entire bridgehead. Rising steeply above the muddy plain, it was likened by Trevor to a sausage, roughly 700 yards long and consisted of five linked plateau, the highest one in the centre reaching up to 170 feet. The most vulnerable point was at the northern tip, which faced towards two Japanese-occupied heights dubbed West and East, Fing East and West and East Fingers. Separated from the rest of the hill and the main body of the brigade by a saddle, this sector was exposed to enemy machine gun fire and sniper fire, as well as the worst of the shelling, which became a regular feature of life in the beachhead. It was this it, to this unhealthy spot that Number Four Troop moved on the, on the morning of 23rd of January, 1945. Over the course of the next eight days, the 24 men of one platoon, four troop, hunkered down amid a tangle of bushes and tree roots at the northern end of the hill. If we could move on, Rob, to uh, pictures uh, 19 to 21. Yep, we're on 19 now. Yep. Are, are they the, the plans or the maps? Yes. Yep, yes. They're the, yep. Are they give an impression of the uh, of the shape and, and uh, the positions of these uh, of the uh, of the various uh, of the commando. Um, a series of two and three man slit trenches were dug to form a box defense around the edge of the northern plateau and in the face of the enemy's ritualistic early morning and sundown bombardments these grew in scale as the brigade historian later stated they quickly learned to dig deep to dig fast and to stay down the shelling was nasty and scary recalled private malcolm mac thompson they knew where we were and they had the position pinpointed the deeper you dug up, the better off you were, but there wasn't much you could do about it apart from hope a shell didn't land on your hole. Some men took the added precaution of covering their trenches with logs, while the slopes were laced with an intricate web of trip wires and signal ropes. There was hardly any verbal ver communication at all, especially during any shelling record, Corporal Arthur Chapman. Orders came via the rope, two tugs for a stand to and one tug for stand down. Given the prolonged nature of the shelling, casualties remark were remarkably light. Number one commando suffered only five men killed or wounded in a week of bombardments from Japanese 75 millimeter guns. Thankfully for the men of four troop, a number of the shells proved to be duds and of the others, many passed over their heads to hit the main part of the hill. Even so, the shelling still took a toll of men's nerves. It wasn't only the shelling that was bad, said Private Frank Hyde, they also had a medium machine gun position, which they fired across at us. And then at night, they try and rattle us with noise, with noise and shouts. It was all done to frighten you into shooting back and giving away your position. Day after day of that was enough to make you a bundle of nerves. To, to add to the, 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 the uh, difficulties, if you like, that uh, number four troop were um, would face at this time, they'd undergone a change of command structure. Um, one officer had been uh, fatally injured in the run up to the uh, third Arakan. Their commanding officer had been wounded at Maibon and they had a change of officer then. Into all of this mix on January the 14th in the midst of the Maibon operations, at another three officers arrived, two of which were, were, were sent to four troop. One of those was a George Noland. And if we start on the pictures uh, 22 through to 29, Rob, um, George Noland was 22 at the time. He was boyish looking, a veteran of the fighting in Sicily and Italy, both of which had been with Peter Young's number three commando. He was born in Catford, South East London, eldest of six children. His mother had died in 1933 and the family moved to Croydon where George attended Elmwood Road School. After his mother's death, the children spent 18 months in a home. Left in 19, uh, they all got separated effectively. Um, George was uh, taken in by the Fellowship of St. Christopher 
uh, which is, is a, a school or a, a, an organization run by the Bishop of London. Um, he was based in Chiswick. And the idea or the motto of this particular home was to give a chap a chance. And it was a home for working boys. Um, so he had a hard, hard time, a hard upbringing and a difficult time. Um, he won a scholarship for technical school in 1939, but decided instead to start making his way in the world and find work. Um, staff at the home thought him an outstanding, if somewhat repressed personality, more fond of sport than of learning, who was ab absolutely outstanding at all athletic attainments. He was called up in 1941, joined the Royal Norfolk Regiment, where he did his basic training, but he did no, he saw no actual service with the, with the regiment. He transferred to the commandos as a volunteer, of course, in September 1942. He was uh, posted to three commando, which was then rebuilding following the landings at Dieppe. And he was sent out with them to Sicily and then got involved in the heavy fighting for Tumoli in Italy in 1943. One of his fellow commandos in, at that time, a chap called Jack Cox, who served with him in Italy, he reckoned that he displayed superb leadership, achieving success with very few words and no fuss. He, he reckoned that he had what he called commando initiative. He was the type of man one never forgets. As a result of his performances with number three commando in 1943, when the commando came back to the UK in the run up to D-Day in 1944, he was uh, sent off to Optu for a commission. He was uh, went through officer's training um, and it was in the course of that that he met and married following a, a whirlwind romance, a Ruby Weston. And I think Ruby is po possibly number 29, is she? On 28. The 28. 28, yeah, 28. Um, and um, they, they at that time, their, their time together was very brief. They were married in September 1944. Um, they had about five or six weeks together when he was stationed uh, in a holding operational commander at Wrexham. Um, and then in November, he was posted to India. Uh, remembering him sort of some 60 years later, she described him as a very shy, a uh, man who absolutely loved soldiering and the army and was determined to better himself. Posted to number one commando, as I said, he joined them at Maibon in on January the 14th, along with two other subalterns. Um, according to his section, one of his section sergeants, a chap called Arthur Happy Jackson, he said, we never really had a chance to get to know him well but in the short time we had with him, he made a good impression. The first thing he did was to come round to all of us and try to make friends. So this was the man in command of four troop or, or of one platoon four troop at the northern tip of Hill 170. And they were in position, had been for 10 days. They were due to be relieved on the morning that the Japanese decided to launch their all out attack on Hill 170. The first warning of anyone had of this particular attack was from a suicide operation carried out by some 70 Japanese engineers armed with pole chargers. And their target was the tank lager to the side of the hill this was positioned near to um, a position occupied by 4-2 Royal Marine Commando. Um, and I'll just quote from the one of the tank officers at the time. His name was Bill Merriam, an officer with the 19th Lancers. There were three tanks, by the way. We were rudely awakened by some very fast and accurate shell fire at about 0545, which continued until 0620, when a babble of voices in the nearby bushes west of our position, followed by the noise of machine guns and gr grenades, 
indicated that we were being attacked. The first 20 minutes were more than confused. Grenades were whizzing through the air from both sides. Bing Wilson, who was commanding the Bombay Grenadier section protecting the tanks, started the ball rolling by shooting the leader of the suicide squad in the face with the sten, with his sten. But there were many more fanatics behind him, and they, after overrunning our forward position, planted some large type of explosive onto the track. There was a terrific green flash and a tremendous bang which drove most people back to their trenches. Two tanks managed to get out and away, and the third tank was burning fiercely, the entire crew having been killed. Ted Ridley, who was a commando in 4-2 Royal Marine Commando, an orderly sergeant, was close by. He said the tank the Japs blew up was about 30 yards from headquarters, and as the ammo inside blew up, a great lump of body just missed my head and landed on the top of George Sunley's trench. Another tank was set afire and the driver drove it in flames all over the top of headquarters positions on the slope of the hill. Luckily, no one was injured, but you, would have, you should have seen Ted Shepard's sniper's rifle. For the men in four troop, there was clearly now something happening uh, they were all positioned, as I said earlier, they, there was a, a box. Um, if we got to pictures um, 30. I'm, I'm on 30 with the George Nolan's trench at the top. Yep, excellent. Yep, yep. Um, and then if we go through from 30 to 34, um, uh, I think that there, there might be some plans showing positions on the hill. But anyway, the the... the the story really was that the um, the first sign was I'm, from. I'm, I'm going to go back, Steve, because they're they're previous, but we'll. Oh, this right. is, this yeah. is quite helpful to go back to these diagrams because they yep. were they were drawn yep. by. They were men. drawn. They were drawn actually by a chap called Mick Williams, who was one of the commandos in four troop in one of those slit trenches, and. Um, he said he, he actually recalled that the Japs began shelling before daybreak and we expected an attack. We stood to and it got light. I saw through a rare gap in the undergrowth, long lines of Japs crawling across the paddy fields towards us from the northwest. We, Corporal Tiki Tai and myself, borrowed the subsection Bren gun from the next slit trench, estimated the range at 600 yards and gave them a few bullets. These, I believe, were the opening shots of the battle. Further, just slightly further back and next door, in the next door trench to Noland, Arthur Happy Jackson recalled, we heard the Japs the other side of the river. You could hear them muttering away. They came on, they came up in wee droves. You couldn't see them until they were almost on, onto you. They made a heck of a noise. They didn't seem to worry. Chuck Hayes, one of the one of the the, uh, the platoon, heard Jackson shout, "Look out, sir! They're coming in fast!" And after that, it was just frantic action the whole time. Mick Williams recalled, "Very quickly, things hotted up. Our visibility was limited to a few yards down the slopes in most places, and the Japs concentrated their attack on our north end. Grenades were in great demand, but the top of the hill was being swept by all sorts of shot and shell." including machine gun fire from another hill. Jackson was under the greatest pressure and called for more grenades. I, call, I collected a spare box from nearby and shouted and started to run along the hill to Sergeant Jackson. As I passed Lieutenant Nolan's trench, he shouted out, run like hell, which I was already doing. And the next moment I was down with a bullet in my chest and my right arm was useless. The box of grenades fell in the undergrowth and comparing notes months later with a friend who later died in Hong Kong, he said it added insult to injury since lying in the bushes wounded, he had a whole box of grenades land on his chest. In those frantic early moments, with the crest flailed by machine gun and grenades, casualties rapidly mounted. Four troops artillery observation officer was fatally hit and one of his, one of his uh, men was wounded beside him. Not far away, Sergeant Les Dunnett slumped temporarily paralyzed by a bullet. In a, in a neighboring trench, Private, Private Tony Pawson was hit. 
and all the time more and more Japanese were pouring onto the lower slopes of the hill. According to Private Frank Hyde, who was in one of the advanced slit trenches, it was mad. No matter how many you killed, they just wouldn't stop. They didn't seem to know the meaning of fear. As soon as I put my head up, I had a bullet go straight through my beret without touching me. According to Jackson, we were firing non-stop. Some of the barrels were red hot. That's how we beat them back. We had Brens and fast firing American Garand rifles, which were like semi Brens. It meant while they were reloading their guns, we were able to shoot them, but there were too many. Amid the mayhem, Jackson watched in awed ad admiration as one of his platoon, Private James Ginger Boyce, coolly took his Bren to pieces to clear a jam before resuming the fight. He thought it worthy of a VC. Sighted in one of the most advanced lit trenches, Boyce would not survive the day. He was among nine men of four troop killed that morning, including among, among them were the best friends, Andy Plew and Jimmy Fitzsimmons. Um, if we could go on to pictures um, 35 to 37, These show pictures of um, Arthur Chapman and some of his friends uh, in, in number four troop. Um, Arthur Chapman was a corporal in number two platoon four troop. He was with Andy Plew, a little further back from Nolan's platoon when the attack began. He recalled hearing the Japanese screaming and shouting as they launched assault after assault. And then above the din, his mates bawling for ammunition. Eventually, the Corps reached them to send reinforcements to help the embattled forward platoon. Chapman was instructed to go, but he recalled how Plew, a young Scottish lad, had volunteered in his place because he wanted to go and help his mate. It was a decision that would cost him his life. It was an absolute bloodbath, said Chapman, and so it was. In one slit trench, man after man was killed or wounded, manning one of the platoon's Bren guns, 10 in all. And if we can go to picture 38, this is uh, Mac Thompson. Just to lift your head above the parapet was to invite instant death. And yet one man miraculously contrived to cheat death repeatedly. From his trench a few yards further back, Mac Thompson looked on in utter amazement as the lone figure, this lone figure darted across the fire swept ground. One moment firing a Bren gun from the hip the next a rifle and then hurling grenades. He seemed to be everywhere. And what's more, he, he appeared strangely indestructible. This was George Noland. He was terrific, recalled Thompson. I saw him standing up and running around firing and throwing grenades. There's no doubt he deserved a VC. In fact, he deserved it 10 times over. From the moment the Japanese launched their first attack on his position around 6.30, Nolan had been the inspirational soul of the commando's defiance. He seemed to be everywhere, shouting encouragement, replenishing dwindling supplies of ammunition, taking over machine guns from men who had been killed or wounded with no apparent concern for his own safety. Jackson was near enough to him above the din of battle to hear him calling out, keep at it boys, keep your heads down. At one point, Jackson saw him standing in the open, bullets chewing the ground around him, firing a rifle until all his ammunition had been exhausted. Another time when two men manning a Bren were wounded, Nolan ran forward, grabbed the machine gun and stood on top of the trench, firing from the hip into the hordes of Japanese less than 10 yards away, while a medic dressed the, the men's wounds and brought them safely away. I think we may have some pictures or artist impressions of these uh, actions by Noland. Um, we do, we do. Yep. We've, we've yep. Them. No. Good, good, okay. Um, his courage seemed inexhaustible. Long after, Jackson was astonished to see him in full view of the Japanese in dead ground beneath them, holding a two inch mortar, which also he also fired from the hip. It was hardly textbook stuff. In fact, many would have dismissed it as well nigh impossible were it not for the fact there were witnesses. He was pointing the mortar straight at them, horizontally, added Jackson. Unbelievably, his unorthodox tactic worked, at least for a time. 
The first bomb killed six enemy soldiers. More followed. It was incredible, continued Jackson. It stopped them in their tracks until he ran out of bombs. Undaunted, Nolan darted back for more and according to an official account, repeated the exercise with similar results. As long as his supply of bombs lasted, the commandos, despite the huge disparity of numbers, were able to hold the Japanese at bay. Soon, however, nearly every one of the original 24 strong platoon sighted on the northern tip of Hill 170 was a casualty, along with many of those sent forward to help. They included Happy Jackson, hit by a bullet and it tore through his lip. Inevitably, George Nolan's luck ran out too. As the Japanese tidal wave lapped within a few feet of his position, he met them head on, first with a rifle, and then when his ammunition ran out, a submachine gun, which he snatched from the ground where it had been dropped by a casualty. He was still on his feet, still firing when he was felled. Some say by a burst of machine gun fire, others a single shot to the head. Vic Ralph, who was age 19 at the time, he was a signaler with four troop. He was a bit further back, just a few yards away. He later recalled that uh, there was a divided opinion about uh, Nolan's actions on that morning. He said there was no doubt he was a very brave man, but there were those who thought he was stupid, that he was lucky to have lasted as long as he did, running out about in the open instead of taking cover. You have to imagine that, that, that this had been going on for nearly two hours, that, that uh, they'd been able to hold back hundreds, literally hundreds of Japanese uh, with just 20, fewer than 20, often fewer than 20 men. According to one of the um, uh, of Nolan's men, Frank Hyde, he said that uh, Nolan deserved the VC he was awarded, but unfortunately he also deserved to get killed. Bill Ling, who was also in four troop further back, he described him as a hero. I think we're, if we go to picture 39, there should be a picture of Bill Ling, he was an original uh, member of the commandos. In fact, he joined the independent companies in 1940. He was a veteran of the early commando raids on occupied Europe. And he described Kangor as the worst and toughest battle of his career. And the Japanese as the hardest of all opponents. They never knew when they were beaten, he said. No matter how many of them you killed, they still kept coming at you time and time again until there were none left. That was what it was like on Hill 170. It was the worst battle I was ever in. Throughout this period, the, the, the and, and you have to imagine that this fight was a, a, in, in a number of different stages. If you like, the early, the first stage was the, the suicide attack. The second stage was the all out assault on, on the Northern tip. Um, this was held for two hours, it was only then that the the advance platoon, the survivors of the advance platoon, were able to pull themselves back. They were forced to come back into the other section post, other, other, the second platoon, if you like, of number four troop, just a little further back. But the Japanese were in no position to advance any further. They'd been, really been given a, an incredible hammering um, by, by the men of four troop. Um, Strangely, they hadn't tried to uh, attack in, on any flank. They'd simply kept pounding away at the same position. And the question was then what to do. That the, 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 they'd almost each side had, had, had hammered themselves into a point where they could neither advance nor retreat. Um, and so the question was what to do next. The commandos decided to put in two counterattacks fairly early on these were within the in, in in the first couple of hours or so after the the Japanese had occupied some of the early positions in in uh, on on the northern tip but there were relatively few men that they could bring together for this attack not knowing whether the Japanese were going to launch further attacks on the flanks so the first attack counterattack was by a platoon of W troop 4-2 Royal Marine Commando and a platoon of three troop, one commando. Um, neither of these advanced very far. The first was given up after just 20 yards, during which time 
that particular platoon of uh, of four two Royal Marine Commando had suffered fifty percent casualties. They were forced to retreat back to the positions that were occupied by the rest of four troop. At the same time, number one platoon of three troop, one commando, attempted to clear the eastern slopes. This too ran into trouble. At the foot of the hill, the, com the commando, collide this the particular platoon, collided with the entrenched Japanese. Um, one of them, a sergeant, responded with an accurate grenade that killed three or four in a weapon pit, from which then seven more Japanese bolted from another dugout. Six of these were rapidly dispatched and the seventh was last seen sprinting into some bushes on the paddy field nearby. But by then, the platoon was taking casualties themselves. First a corporal, then the officer, and then another man, one after the other was being hit, some seriously wounded. Um, one of the one of the uh, young NCOs, a chap called Edmonds, recorded his account of what followed. Keeping very low, we were moving down the side of the hill. Now, and the fighting to our to our left was getting fierce. Suddenly, Dearden, who was in front of me, was fatally wounded. We carried on down the hill, and Sergeant Roberts was hit, but he crawled back up the hill. We consolidated our position and Sweeney and McFall set up the Bren facing up the hill in the direction of the Japanese. Just a short distance from the bottom of the hill in the paddy field was a bamboo hut. On seeing this, Hobbs ran across the open ground to the hut, disappeared from view, and we heard a burst from his Tommy gun. Then he came running back to say that he had killed four Japs who had been hiding, probably waiting for us. He then dashed across the open ground to go back to the hut, but a Japanese sniper had seen him. And as he ran across the paddy field, he was hit in the jaw. This gives a kind of idea of the sort of the, 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 the fast and furious nature of the fight. Um, there was there was one of the one of the men was wounded early on. He was in a position where they thought they could recover him, but immediately they tried to do so. The Japanese had him covered, and so this poor man was left calling out for help throughout the rest of that morning while the Japanese fired at anyone who tried to move anywhere near to him. The, the attacks having these, both these counter attacks eventually petered out. There was nothing they could do. They couldn't advance. They couldn't take any, any of the Japanese positions that they, they captured. And Brigadier Campbell Hardy in command of number three commando brigade met with Ken Trevor and they decided that they would carry out what they called a blitz counterattack by a combination of 4-2 and 1 commando, starting just after midday. Um, the plan was quite simple, that they were to advance in similar fashion, really, along the sides of the hill. Um, and they, they unfortunately met with similar results as the earlier attacks. Um, one of them, one of the people in, in just to give, give a flavor of these attacks, a chap called Bill Stoneman, a Marine in 4-2 Royal Marine Commando, was a member of X Troop that took part in the counterattack. Um, and one of, one of his comp colleagues, uh, a chap called Homan, later wrote the following account. Our job was to prevent them from getting any further and if necessary, knock them off the hill. Our subsection was in the right hand side of the hill facing the Japs. So into the fracas we go. Lieutenant Nobby Hall goes storming forward with Bill Stoneman, Badger Ellis, and another newcomer and myself, with, as I thought, thought the rest of the subsection. It wasn't long before the Japs closed in on poor Nobby and he was bayoneted to death. Badger Ellis and the other man was killed, and I myself was wounded in several places. Somewhere in the vicinity was Sergeant Major Bert Welsh. While all this was going on, the Japs were coming up the side of the hill in large numbers, shouting Banzai. If it wasn't for Bill, I wouldn't be writing this letter today. And it's thanks to him I got out. He helped me to a reasonably safe place and then went back to face the Japs. I managed to get a safe distance away from the firing line. And when I did, there was our subsection Bren gun unit lying on the ground. The very place was, was where we started from. 
In other words, they hadn't moved an inch. He described the Japanese cross machine gun fire as blistering and murderous. Number, uh, taking part in this same attack were number six troop. If we go on to picture 40, Rob, um, there should be a picture there of a chap with a pipe in his mouth. Yeah. And this is a chap called acting bombardier Ernest Tag Barnes. He was a member of six troop and he's left one of the very few uh, detailed accounts of his commando service and also of his part in the fighting at Kangor for which he was later to receive the military medal. He talks about the, the build up to this counter attack. He says, bayonets were fixed and every man from Lieutenant Tony Palmer, who was to lead us to the last man was armed with either a Garand repeating rifle or a Tommy gun. As the lower slopes were reached to start the ascent, one could appreciate the dilemma the enemy had faced when trying to dislodge us. It proved impossible to employ a concentrated charge in any sort of line, and the platoon stumbled upwards along small tracks through scrub and broken trees, almost following my, almost follow my leader pattern. Suddenly, as if someone had thrown a switch, we found ourselves in the thick of it. There were Japs everywhere. I emptied a magazine and dipped and clipped a second into place. There was a lot of shouting and grenades exploding. Tony Palmer was in the middle of what seemed a mass of flailing bodies, striking out savagely with his bayonet. A sight that has always remained vivid, vividly in my mind was a wall of dead bodies with Japs, Japanese faces staring over the top. Sergeant Morris and I found ourselves with six feet, within six feet of each other in a small clearing. I noticed his, his shirt was torn and there was a lot of blood on his chest. Let's get the bastards, Tag, he shouted, and we moved forward together, firing as we went. There came a loud explosion between us, and we were both knocked to the ground. The air was filled with thick, swirling dust. My right leg felt as if it had been hit with a sledgehammer, and I remember distinctly, without looking, feeling down with apprehension, wondering if my leg was still attached. I could do no more, as in, and I began to drag myself back. I had moved less than a yard when Morris called weakly, Tag, don't leave me. Barnes actually, despite his injuries, crawled back and managed to help Morris to some kind of cover. But in the end, he couldn't get him out of, out of danger and he was forced to abandon him. And it, he only managed to get back himself by the narrowest of margins. And he was able to send a, another party to, get, to try and get to him. But by the time they reached him, he, his, uh, or by the time he was recovered later, he had died. If we go on to pictures 41 and 42, Rob, yeah. um, as, as this uh, throughout the, the morning and throughout the, the morning, these, these, these attacks had been going on and then into the early afternoon, the counterattacks had actually, as I say, other than to hold or prevent the Japanese from any further advance, they hadn't been able to recover any of the lost ground. We now see um, two unlikely participants in the fighting at Kangor. One of them is, uh, the first one is Russell Spur, who was a stills photographer with the Royal Indian Navy and his colleague and friend, Sub-Lieutenant Frank Worth, who was a movie cameraman. They were attached to the 55th motor launch flotilla uh, and they recorded their part in the landings on the, the Maibon Peninsula. And they had accompanied the number three commando brigade um, to Kangor as well. And he's left an account of what followed and how they got caught up in the events on that uh, day. Frank and I found ourselves mixed up with a <clears throat> with a battered but determined platoon attempting to recapture the hill. Their platoon commander had been killed leading an earlier assault. Dead lay all around the foot of the hill and among the trees and bushes that concealed the crest. It wasn't long before I was telling myself this battle was hardly my personal concern. Our duties as naval cameramen naturally enjo enjoined us to concentrate on the seaborne war, but being members of an inter-service organization, our responsibilities could not cease at the beachhead. So now we were stumbling towards the lower slopes of the disputed hill, and it was too late to turn back. Ahead lay the first 
last few yards of the open ground before we reached the hill. The firing grew heavier. The sergeant leading us went down with a bullet in his thigh, bleeding horribly, while the rest, rest of us gratefully went to earth. Several sharp clicks came from somewhere up the hill. They were clearly audible through the din of battle. The Japanese were priming grenades by wrapping them on their helmets. They sent them rolling down the slopes towards us. Fortunately, the grenades went off before they could roll within range. Here they come, Frank yelled and turned over on his back, aiming, aiming his camera. I thought he meant the Japanese doing another banzai from the hilltop. But it was a fresh squad of commandos charging across our cringing bodies. The surviving tank roared past us. We crawled out of our sheltered position and followed crouching behind its scarred steel bulk. The main gun banged and crashed, firing point blank into an enemy platoon assembling for a flank attack from the back, back, back of the hill. Tracer poured from the tank's machine guns. Thunderous rumblings came from the adjoining hills as dive bombers went in with napalm and high explosives. 25 pounder guns mounted on floats in the chongs brought the noise to a shattering crescendo. Fresh waves of commandos rushed past to finish off the enemy. They need not, not have bothered. No one was left alive. A trench at the bottom of the hill was filled to overflowing with obscenely tumbled bodies. The, the fighting on Hill 170 continued on into the evening, but the actual attempts to attack by either side had fizzled out. Both sides were worn out, exhausted. They'd reached the end of their tether, really, at this stage. Reinforcements were pouring onto the hill for the commandos from other neighboring hills, particularly number five commando. And it was decided to hold firm for the night and await the following, the following morning. I think we have picture there of, we should on 43, We'll show you uh, Ken Trevor, who was the commander of number one commando. Um, and he, in, in, in unison with, and we've got picture 44, Peter Young, who was second in command of three commando brigade, in, com in, com in, in company with uh, Campbell Hardy, had decided that they would wait until the following morning before carrying out a further counterattack. Next morning, however, it was, as Young himself says, completely quiet. And the commander of five commando, is, uh, the second in command, in fact, because the commanding officer had been wounded the previous day, was convinced that the Japanese had, uh, had quit. And he was right. As five commando pushed forward, they found the northern tip of the hill deserted, but carpeted with their dead. When it was light enough, Young went forward to look at the ground where four troop, one commando had fought. He later said, I could hardly move a step without treading on a dead Japanese. There were nearly 300 of them and only one who still showed signs of life. I was deeply impressed by the murderous onslaught of the Japanese and the almost incredible staunchness of the men who held a battalion at bay. The Japanese had attacked with a fanatical brutish courage which, which lacked subtlety and made little use of manoeuvre. But the men who put them into attack Hill 170 had put his finger unerringly on the key to the whole position. Any failure there and our whole bridgehead was in danger of collapse. As Bill Slim had said, Kangor was indeed the crisis point, crisis battle of the Arakan operations. It had been fought and won by three commando brigade. The Japanese had pulled back. They'd withdrawn and they had tried then effectively to break out by scattering. Caught between the 82nd Division and 25th Division, together with the three commando brigade, the Japanese, wrote Bill Slim, scattered and in the first half of February, took to the hills to the east, leaving behind them over 1,000 dead, 16 guns, many vehicles, and great quantities of equipment. It was a crushing victory, and according to Slim, 
a first rate example of combined operations by all three services. Hadn't been without cost though. The three commando units heavily involved that day had suffered more than 130 casualties. One commando had lost two officers and 20 men killed and one officer and 43 men wounded. 42 Royal Marine Commando, two officers and 17 men killed, three officers and 21 men wounded. And five commando, which had brought come in as, as reinforcements later in the day, had suffered one killed and three one officer killed and three men killed, along with 22 more men wounded. According to Aubrey Buxton, the uh, Royal Artillery officer who had um, been so uh, scathing of the of the bridgehead itself. He believed that the heroism and guts displayed by the commandos in repelling attack after attack at fearful cost was beyond all praise. Here, if ever, he wrote, the British soldier proved conclusively his superiority over the so-called jungle wizard of 1942. And uh, I'd just like to go on if I can, and just that's the basic, the story, if you like, of the, 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 the defense and um, victory at Hill 170. Um, if I can just go on to the pictures from four, 45 to 50, and I can't quite remember the order of these, but- um, We've got George Nolan's um, grave. Ah, we've got his grave, and then we go on, I think, to um, eventually we'll see a picture of his um, sister standing by Nolan's Grove, is it? Um, yeah. The sign, the street sign. Um, after, after the war, his efforts were, were not forgotten in far away Norwich of all places, but the home of the Royal Norfolk Regiment, which claimed him as one of their own. Um, despite the fact he'd served obviously in the commandos for, for, for all of his war service, um, he was badged to the Royal Norfolk Regiment. And after the war, uh, a road was named after him. And uh, there you see it in its very early form with its prefab houses um, and his sister visiting in the late 1940s. Um, we then go on, I think, to show his widow, George Nolan's widow, she later remarried uh, an American, went out to live in the United States in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, But she got in touch with the Royal Norfolk Regiment in the early to in, in the early 21st century, a few years ago, and um, they contacted me knowing of my interest. And uh, I was able to meet her and show her around the various sites in, in Norwich, which are connected with um, George. Uh, and you'll see there's one picture which shows her sitting or, or standing outside some memorial cottages, uh, which all bear the names of Victoria Cross recipients from the Norfolk Regiment, um, of which George has obviously won. And, um, she was then able to, uh, I think she was presented with a replica of his Victoria Cross and there should be a picture of her holding one of those. Yeah. Um, this was uh, in, in lieu really of the Victoria Cross which was originally presented to her in 1946. But because she was then leaving to live, make a new life for herself in the United States, she felt it right and proper that the, the Victoria Cross should be remain in the hands of George's family. After all, she'd only known him for a very short time. Um, and so she gave the Victoria Cross to George Nolan's father, who later displayed it in the, the pub that he owned uh, or ran. And uh, unfortunately, in the 1950s, this pub was broken into and the Victoria Cross was stolen and it has never been recovered, which is a, a rather sad legacy of, of this extraordinary story. Um, I think that uh, when, I, when I interviewed um, Colonel Trevor, his recollection, he was very struck by this uh, young officer 
who he'd known only for a very short time. And he called him a, a young officer full of enthusiasm. He says he took the brunt of a complete Japanese swarming attack, the whole thing. He was up against an almighty force and showed tremendous guts trying to push them back. And he did, but he obviously paid for it with his life. Um, but that, that, that truly is the, the story of Kango. I know the focus has been much on, on number one commando and I apologize for the issues with the pictures and hope that you've been able to actually um, see enough of them to get a flavor of the story um, of, of this battle, which is, I think, un under, under recorded, if you like, um, possibly known mainly by people with commando associations, uh, relatives who've been there, um, but uh, deserves, I think, to, to have a wider audience. So I'm very happy to have been able to speak about it this evening. Um, but uh, so well, we're very grateful to you, Steve. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. We're um, very grateful to you. And thank you for persevering against all odds um, with the technological right. difficulties. And thank you, Rob, for stepping into the breach. And the yeah, pair of you, you know, you, you highlighted, as you've already said, one of the lesser known battles of a campaign. And judging from the chat tonight, there are lots and lots of people whose fathers were there in five commando, one commando, and I believe even a veteran. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to take questions, Rob, shall we? Yes, why, why, why don't we take questions now? Um, again, apologies, uh, the, the uh, technology has tended to work for us in the past, but it gave up on us tonight. It was only a matter of time, I suspect. I've been watching the, <laughs> um, the commentary as well, and it's been fabulous. Thank you very much indeed for uh, everyone's comments. And I can only apologize for, for, um, for the presentation itself. I can't actually see that there are any um, direct question, questions in the um, Q&A. Let me just have a quick check. Um, but uh, if there's anything that you want, no, I, I don't think there's anything there. If there's any uh, questions that people want, it's a lot of really useful commentary in the um, in the chat box. Then um, by all means, send us an email, and um, we'll uh, I'll forward them on to Steve, and we can we can uh, get them uh, answered answered pretty quickly. But uh, no, back to you, Sylvia. Yeah, that's great, Rob. We're always happy to hear from you. And as I say, thank you all so much. Um, we're just going to um, tell you that Osprey are publishing Rob's most recent publication, War of Empires, in paperback on the 11th of May, which will be available from all good bookshops. Alternatively, you can purchase it from us and uh, where half of your um, the money of the cover price will come to the charity. We've got lots of Naga crafts on the shop and jewellery available, plus a wide range of books on the Burma campaign. So really, that just leaves me to thank you all for joining us tonight. You've been very enthusiastic audience. You're brilliant. And let you know that our next webinar is on Thursday, April the 23rd, when Rob will be talking about his new paperback, War of Empires. We'll see you then. Good night.